Good morning. Welcome to this. Welcome back to this lecture series. I believe we are going to um, uh, go with um, a lecture number five, if I remember correctly. That is correct. So we are going to talk about a specific electrochemical sensor, and we'll take CO2 a sensor as a case study. So I give you some references here if you want to know more about the this topic, and particularly this article actually describes the how we make the probe and how we test in real automotive engine. So this is how we make um, the um, CO2 sensor. Uh, we make the electrolyte simply by centering. So you can see the electrolyte is based on lithium phosphate. It's a lithium ion conductor, and we use a little bit of silica to do um, to add as a sintering aid so that we get very high density um, lithium phosphate. You can see that in the microstructure right there. Then this is the uh, reference. So we put two gold pads to connect to the measuring device. And then one side, we put the reference electrode two-phase mixture of lithium titanate and TiO2, and you can see that the um, electrode has to be porous, and that's the microstructure. And then on the other side, we put the sensing electrode, which is lithium carbonate, and also the microstructure, you can see it's highly porous microstructure, and that's how they should be. So this is the reference electrode. This is the sensing electrode, and this is the electrolyte, which is a lithium ion conductor. So here is the detail about the um, uh, electrical potential that builds up in this galvanic cell. And the two HAP cell reactions are shown here, the reaction on lithium carbonate sensing electrode and the reaction on the two-phase mixture of lithium titanate and TiO2. What you are trying to measure in the EMF is this overall potential. And the overall potential can be given by the NAST equation where this delta G naught depends on various formation energies that we can look up um, in the thermodynamic database, but it also depends on the partial pressure of CO2. So this becomes a CO2 sensor by measuring the EMF. So if you look at the sensor signal EMF millivolt as a function of time, you can see at low concentration and at high concentration percent level is a PPM level and at various temperatures. So 400 all the way to 600 degrees Celsius. So if we now go and do the calibration curve, you can see that um, it, it slightly, it, it's uh, different from the theoretical value and it has to do with the uh, you know, electrokinetics and so on that I'm not going to go into, but nonetheless, it gives you a linear behavior. So you can see that at 600 ppm level, you see a linear behavior, and at percent level, you get a linear behavior as well, and then so on. At various temperatures, you get this linear behavior of the measured EMF versus logarithm of CO2, as you expect from the NANST equation. Then we looked at the interference, and we looked for interference from hydrocarbon, for example, something like CH4. We don't see much interference. You can see these are spikes when you chase the gas, but you don't see any substantial, substantive uh, change in the signal from introduction of CH4. Then when we test the interference from CO, and as we keep on increasing CO concentration, you can see there is some signal change. So there is seems to be some um, CO interference. And what we believe is happening is that at this operation temperature, CO actually reacts with the gaseous oxygen forming CO2. And we are actually getting this additional response from this 
newly produced CO2 by the oxidation of CO. So clearly CO is interfering, but the interference comes through the production of this additional CO2. So it can be calibrated and actually estimate what that interference amount should be. And this can be deducted from the actual CO2 signal. Then we looked at the interference from NOx, nitric oxide, uh, while at high temperature, we didn't see much interference, but at low temperature, like 400, we saw substantial interference from introduction of nitric oxide. And what we found out from the FTIR type measurement that um, in the NOx environment, um, lithium nitride is formed, okay? which is stable at low temperature, but that lithium nitrate is not stable at high temperature. And that's why we don't see interference at high temperature from NO, but we see interference from NO at low temperature. So we made the other important aspect that we studied is the uh, making a sensor humid, humidity interference free. And that's a big push in sensing community because most sensors actually uh, get interference from humidity water vapor. So here is our construction of our uh, lithium carbonate based sensor. Again, electrolyte, two gold pads. One side has this two phase mixture reference electrode and the other side lithium carbonate, which is the sensing electrode. And we make another sensor where we actually put lithium carbonate particles barium carbonate. So this is a lithium carbonate coated, coated with a very thin layer of barium carbonate. So how do we coat lithium carbonate with barium carbonate? So we put disperse our lithium carbonate powders in lithium nit barium nitrate solution. And then we disperse it in aqueous solution then do, um, you know, uh, we roto evaporator, we rotate and um, we basically evaporate the solvent and eventually uh, get the solid particle coated with actually barium nitrate that we are putting in, a thin layer of that that we need to decompose in CO2 environment. And we do compose it around a little bit less than 600 degrees C. So during the decomposition reaction, barium carbonate is formed. So this lithium carbonate particles are covered with a thin layer of barium, barium carbonate. And barium carbonate being hydrophobic, we actually were able to eliminate the interference from humidity. You can see that uh, between the dry CO2 and humid CO2, we actually um, bubble CO2 through water flask to carry humidity. And you can see there is quite a bit of interference from humidity for this sensor, four to nine percent. Then when we use the other sensor where lithium carbonate is coated with barium carbonate, you can see that that hum humidity interference is practically eliminated. So this is really was a milestone um, in this in the sensor. So we looked at the, um, you know, if you look at the stability of the sensor, sensor signal normalized by the uh, E naught in dry and humid, humid environment, you can see practically no interference from humidity. And looking at the long-term stability tested over 60 days. So this is tested in, um, this color changed. So this should be 5% CO2, and this should be 10% CO2. And you can see for both these cases, the sensor signal is very, very stable. So it doesn't, doesn't the signal doesn't degrade with, with a function of time. So this is very good because this is a very uh, robust sensor showing long-term stability. Then we make probe, so our probe is made 
This is our CO2 probe. So you can see that that's the disk of lithium phosphate, which is electrolyte. And on the same phase of that electrolyte, we put um, the reference electrode and the sensing electrode. We can paint brush or we can screen print, uh, but we can put both electrode on the same phase. Then we package this into protective, you know, casing like this. And then we test this in real automotive engine. So we actually hit the sensor um, and we keep the sensor temperature at above um, the engine temperature. So you can see that as we change the RPM, the sensor signal varies anywhere from 100 to 350 degrees C. So we need to, uh, we put a PID controlled heater on the back of the sensor and by supplying electric current, we can heat the sensor. And the idea would be that the sensor would be kept above the fluctuating temperature. So it has to be above 350 degrees. And you can see that we, we can, with the heater, we can actually maintain the temperature around 450 over just over many days. Very repeatable temperature profile. And the temperature uh, actually, you know, sort of varies to plus and plus or minus one degree C variation in very little. So this is the temperature at which we keep the sensor at. And then here is the engine test. So we look at the signal of our sensor and where, wherever there is a CO2 change, and the change in the RPM in the engine, there's a change in the signal. This is a one level of CO2, this is a different level, and CO2 changes again, and we can go back. We can see that it fully recovers. And how do we know that we are measuring change in the CO2? We can actually look at the Horiba analyzer signal, and we can see the Horiba analyzer is showing CO2 change level during the same cycles. So clearly, we are measuring the CO2 changes in the engine engine operation. We look, look at the stability of the sensor over three days, three different days of testing, and you can see the slight change in the signal, but more or less it shows very similar behavior. And we actually do the calibration of the sensor before we take it to the engine test, those are the red dots. So we measure EMF as a function of CO2 in the lab before we put it in the engine. And then after the engine test, over several days, we bring the sensor back to the lab and do the same measurement. And you can see that data is falling very well. There is some drift, some change, but more or less sensor is still active and intact. So with that, I'm, I'm done with this lecture and um, we'll move on to the next lecture.